What's up y'all, Drew with Princess Craft RV and today we are going to be walking through the Ibex 23 RLDS. If you enjoy the content that we produce, please don't forget to like, share and subscribe and we really hope you enjoy this walkthrough. All right guys, so starting right up front here as always, the Ibex here is going to ride on a two and five sixteenths inch ball. So first step is going to be slide our slide latch into the unlocked position. It will hold back into that position. We will then center our ball underneath the coupler. Once centered, we go ahead and lower our jack down on top. Once fully seated on that ball, we can go ahead and take our slide latch, sliding that forward, paying special attention that both of these little teeth on either side of that latch are fully engaged in the frame. Of course, not a bad idea to go back and pin this with a secondary pin, not only for safety, but security as well. So from there, we're going to go ahead and take our tow chains. We will cross those underneath the coupler. We will hook those to the receiver of the vehicle. Make sure you do have enough room to make your turns left or right, but not so much room that they may make contact with the pavement. Also very important riding right next to those tow chains is going to be your emergency breakaway cable. It is very important that you utilize a third or separate connection point on the receiver for this. So whether that's a quick link, a carabiner, whatever you got to attach this separate on the receiver. Uh, what this does is again, it's your emergency breakaway cable. If these other tow components were to become compromised and the vehicle started to separate, this is going to act like a rip cord to the electric brakes doing its best to kind of stop the unit in its tracks. Also right next to those other tow components is going to be your seven way plug. This will plug into the corresponding receptacle on your bumper and give you full function to your tow vehicles, charging system, marker lights, tail lights, as well as your braking system. So coming up top here to our electric tongue jack, uh, you have a light that gives you a point of reference if you're backing up to the unit at dark time. We'll also help light this space if you are doing any of that unhooking or hooking up after dark. And then we have a clearly marked momentary switch up or down here uh, for your direction of travel. Now, if for whatever reason you were to have like maybe a power loss situation, you ran out of battery, something along those lines, you can always operate this manually. So if we pull this plug back, you are going to see a drive nut. We do have the corresponding handle for that drive nut. And if we go ahead and seat everything properly, that again will allow us to uh, load and unload the camper in the event of a power loss situation. So directly behind that, we have two 20 pound propane cylinders. These will be full for you at time of delivery. Uh, when it does come to servicing these tanks, it is very easy to do so. You're going to first make sure that the valves are in the closed position here. We're then going to rotate or loosen this oversized wing nut. And there's no need to really remove anything. If you loosen this up enough, you can just lift up on that T-bar and actually slide that tank out of position to allow you to get it filled. Of course, after you've disconnected your pigtails uh, and it is free working. Now, in between those two tanks, you are going to find a automatic switchover propane regulator. So the idea being is that you see there is a little indicator here and whichever tank that's pointing at would be considered our primary tank. So the idea being is that if we had both of the service valves on the top of the tank open, this being our primary tank, we went ahead and used the entirety of that initial tank. It will automatically switch over here to the secondary tank. Now, if in the interim, we would like to remove our primary tank to have it filled or serviced, all we need to do is go ahead and rotate this to our secondary tank that's going to kind of close everything off. And then we will then, again, be able to go ahead and remove this tank. And once we return it back into service, we essentially start that process over. Now, if we look here at the, the kind of eyeglass of, the, indicator, or of the, the regulator here, you're going to see a flow indicator. Uh, now that will pinwheel over to green when you do have propane flowing through the lines. If your tanks are completely empty, that will pinwheel over to red, of course, letting you know that you are out of gas. Uh, this is all covered during travel with your propane cover here. This is not only going to just keep any rain or weather off of these tanks, but it will also protect them from road debris, things like that. It does just go ahead and slip over. One thing to take notice is this door is going to open uh, away from the camper. So reason being is that if you didn't, if this were to come on loose or you didn't screw it down enough, 
you don't want that door to potentially catch air going down the road. So remember just the positioning of that. Uh, I believe there is a bungee that will actually strap this down here, kind of wraps in between the propane tanks for you. And then hopping back here to our battery banks. Uh, now, generally this unit is going to come standard with a single group 24 lead acid battery. This particular customer has upgraded a, to a second battery. Now these are again, lead acid batteries or flooded batteries. So what that means for you is they will carry a fair bit of maintenance. Uh, two or three times a year, call it every 90 days. We're gonna go ahead and pull these vent panels off of each battery. You'll, you'll see that there's a water inside and that a, there is also a clear marked water level. It's going to be our goal to maintain that water level using distilled water only. And again, it's gonna keep our batteries in tip top shape if we are inspecting that water level every 90 days. Now, when it does come to uh, storing the unit, if we wanna keep these batteries in tip top shape, we're gonna go ahead and utilize the battery disconnect switch here. So for periods of long-term storage, uh, it's best with any 12 volt system, you'll find that you have nominal or phantom draws. Uh, best way or easiest way to go ahead and isolate those batteries is going to be with this battery disconnect switch. And again, we're going to do that when we are storing the unit for long periods of time. So you may ask yourself, what do you do with your seven way plug while the unit is being stored? Uh, generally, this is susceptible to water damage potentially and oxidization, things like that. Uh, it's an easy problem to correct if it happens, but easiest way is going to be prevention. So uh, what Ibex has done is they went ahead and put a little uh, keeper there to allow that to be kind of protected slightly from the elements when in storage. It's a really great feature. We'll keep you from having to clean those terminals in the future. Now, moving on here, we have our stabilizer jacks, as always, on all four corners of the unit. Now, these are for stabilization. They're not for leveling. Generally, you will level the camper first and then go ahead and lower these down. If we are leveling the camper front to back, we're going to use that electric tongue jack and then leveling from left to right will be done with the tires in your choice of a leveling kit. So once we are satisfied with our level, we then go ahead and run these down. You're gonna use the included crank handle to do so. You're going to insert that over top of that drive nut. And again, you're gonna crank this down so you make contact with the pavement, maybe just a quarter turn more to shore up that floor. But again, we're gonna handle these with a light touch. They're not load bearing jacks. They are, again, just to stabilize the camper from bouncing on the suspension. Large pass-through storage compartment here. You'll find that all the compartments on this camper are gonna utilize that magnetic hold open, which is again, an excellent feature. Uh, only thing to be aware of is you do have your inverter in this particular compartment. So make sure that whatever you're storing in that compartment isn't gonna do any damage to your inverter or uh, mess with the wiring that they have ran through the compartment. Next up is going to be our water sources. Uh, first up is going to be our non-pressurized water or potable water. Oh, excuse me, basically we are going to use this uh, fitting here to go ahead and fill that onboard water tank. What we're gonna do is we will go ahead and take our fresh water drinking hose. We're gonna go ahead and insert that into the orifice. We are going to fill up until we are satisfied. Once we are, we cap it off. Now, again, just a reminder, this is non-pressurized water in nature. Uh, what the manufacturer has done is included a 12 volt water pump to go ahead and pressurize that system, draw that water up from the tank to the fixtures to make it usable. Now, down below, we have our city water connection. Now, obviously, city water is pressurized directly from the line. More often than not, it's actually over-pressurized for what these units are rated for. Generally with any camper, you'll find a working water pressure in between 50 and 75 PSI or 40 and 75 PSI. Um, out there in the wild, you could run into anywhere from 80 to 100 PSI. So best case scenario is going to be using a water pressure regulator. Uh, this is included with your purchase. This will go ahead and regulate that water pressure down in between 40 and 50 PSI, which is of course uh, within the recommendations of this particular unit. So you're gonna hook this directly onto the water source as close to the water source as you can get. So hook this onto the spigot first, then go ahead and hook your hose to that. Next up, we're going to take our other side of the hose and we're gonna rotate this hose connection here to go ahead and secure that to the unit. Uh, if for whatever reason, your water pressure regulator were to uh, become unserviceable, you know, lost, damaged, whatever, make sure that we are replacing this before we take the unit out. That's gonna, of course, be best for your freshwater plumbing. Now, we've talked about how we fill our non-pressurized water here or our potable water. 
Uh, next up is going to be how to drain it. We can see it clearly marked here on the body that our fresh water drain is going to be down below. And what they use is just a half inch cap to go ahead and cap off that water line. It is a gravity feed system. So basically when it does come to go ahead and drain it, you just as easy as unscrewing that fitting there. Now, when you do go ahead and, and you know, return the unit back to service or you want to fill that tank, you may have to give it a couple wraps with some Teflon tape to make that water tight. So just a heads up there. Now, the manufacturer is going to recommend that anytime the unit is gonna be in storage for more than seven days, that we do go ahead and drain all of the water from the system. Now, you only have to drain that freshwater holding tank is if you have actively put water in it. So it's not something that you're going to be doing every single time, but just remember, if you put water in the system, have not used the entirety of it, you will have to drain the remaining water out before putting the unit into storage. Further down the body here, we are going to find our grab handles to go ahead and dump our wastewater. Uh, you'll have a gray handle for gray water and a black handle for black water. Gray water is going to be anything that comes from the sink or the shower. And black water is going to be anything that comes from the toilet. So your solid body waste, things like that. Now do keep in mind that uh, further, a little bit further down is going to be your sewer outlet connection. So this is gonna utilize a standard bayonet style fitting. So kind of the chain of events is going to be removing this guy here. And if you go ahead and take a look here at the cap, you have two keyholes. You have four prongs along the outside. This is a standardized fitting in the RV industry. If we go ahead and take a look at our sewage hose, you may be able to go ahead and see those same keyholes. So the idea being is that when it does come to dump your wastewater, we're gonna go ahead and put either our cap or our sewage hose in that halfway position. We're gonna give it a, a quarter turn until it stops and locks on. That's gonna make sure it's nice and watertight. Now from there, we're going to go ahead and generally the popular option is going to be opening up our black water first, letting that drain completely, closing that off, we're then gonna go ahead and open up our gray water, allow that to rinse any shared plumbing between the two systems and rinse our sewage hose on the way out. Now, a couple rules uh, when you do go ahead and dump is those valves should never be open at the same time. It's our goal to avoid any cross contamination or back feeding, things like that. Uh, also, you're gonna wanna make sure you keep that black water uh, valve, especially in the closed position. We're gonna use the monitor panel on the inside and we are only going to dump as necessary. So that's very important. We wanna keep that solid body waste, that toilet paper, things like that, in as wet and flowing condition so they can easily evacuate that tank when we do go ahead and dump. Now, another really cool feature that they have here on the Ibex is going to be the black tank flush. Uh, what that's going to do is correspond with a jet inside the black water tank, specifically designed to help blast off compounded toilet waste, body waste, things like that. Keep those sensors in as clean of condition as we can. So uh, once we've went ahead and dumped both of our systems, we're then going to open up that black water valve. We're gonna keep that open. We're gonna go ahead and take any old garden hose and hook up to this fitting here. Once we've done so, uh, we're gonna allow that, we're gonna pressurize that system, allow those jets to go ahead and clean that tank. Very, very important that we only do that with the black water valve in the open position because we don't wanna overflow that black water holding tank. So uh, this is the sewage hose that we include with your purchase, your starter kit. It's meant to get you started. Uh, it's not gonna last forever. So when it does come time to upgrade your hose, it's gonna be my recommendation that you upgrade to one with a clear elbow at the end. The reason being is it will be helpful when utilizing the black tank flush if you can watch until that water runs clear essentially. Once you've done so, you know you've su sufficiently went ahead and rinsed out that tank. So no better time than the present to go ahead and talk about our slide out maintenance. Uh, this unit is going to utilize the Schwintech system. Uh, so what that means for us is every 90 days, we do need to go ahead and lubricate these tracks. What we're gonna use to do so is going to be a dry silicone or PTFE silicone spray. We're just going to go ahead and spray these tracks. Now you have ones here at the bottom on each side and then some at the top on each side. So go ahead, spray all four tracks with some silicone. Go ahead and run that slide in and out a few times to distribute that lubricant and you're gonna be good to go for the next 90 days. Now, at that same time, we do want to go ahead and condition these seals. Uh, you have rubber seals that run the full uh, 360 degrees around the slide. We're going to use an RV grade seal conditioner to go ahead and spray those down. We're going to wipe off any excess. We don't want that dripping down here onto the fiberglass. 
But once we've wiped that excess off, we're gonna go ahead and uh, be good to go again for the 90 days. Now keep in mind that this slide does seal in both directions. It seals when it's closed and it seals when it's open. So we do have a corresponding set of seals on the interior. Uh, might as well just go ahead and treat those at the same time you're gonna go ahead and treat these exterior seals. Uh, now we're gonna drop down here and talk about a very important thing with any trailer that's going to be tire pressure and lug nuts. This particular unit is going to utilize a 65 PSI tire pressure. That is the max tire pressure rating. You'll find that stamped here on the sidewall of the tire in that more traditional location. If you have problems seeing that, uh, you can always use the data tag that you're going to find on the driver's side front corner of the unit. Now, again, with any trailer tire, we run them at the max. That is going to give us the highest flexibility in terms of weight rating. Whether we completely full or completely empty, that 65 PSI is going to be a great number. Now, lug nuts here have been torqued down to our shop our tower torques down in our shop to a hundred foot pounds. Uh, the manufacturer is going to recommend a initial retorque procedure. Uh, you'll find that outlined here on this sticker. And this particular manufacturer is going to recommend the initial 50, 100 and 200 miles of travel that you go ahead and check those lug nuts, make sure they are maintaining that hundred foot pounds of torque. You will need a torque wrench to do so. So make sure you uh, invest in one of those. Generally, these manufacturers will further recommend that at the start of each trip there on after, you do go ahead and just inspect those lug nuts, check that torque, make sure they are, uh, again, maintaining that level of torque. Next up is going to be our power supply here. This is your cord, comes with the unit. Generally, these are, these are about 25, 30 feet in length. Uh, if we go ahead and take a look here at the plug, it, it will only plug in one way. So we see we have two slotted receptacles and one L shape. We have the corresponding prongs there. And just like when you were a kid, if you line up the shapes, everything's gonna go in nice and easy. Now this is a twist lock. So we go ahead and give that an eighth inch turn to the right that locks it in. Then we do have a secondary collar here to screw down and secure that connection even further. Now it's gonna be my recommendation with every unit that I deliver uh, that you go ahead and add a 30 amp surge protector in line. Uh, of course, I don't need to tell you there's a ton of stuff going on within these units electronically. Out there in the wild, you may be opening yourself up to natural surges, substandard wiring, dirty power, things like that. So the only way to effectively protect yourself is going to be adding a 30 amp surge protector. If you do have any questions on the products that we recommend or how to use them, feel free to go ahead and give our parts department a call. They would be more than happy to educate you further on just what we recommend and how to use it. Now also included, is going to be a small 30 to 15 amp puck style reducer. What this is going to be good for is you can go ahead and use this to pre-cool your refrigerator, test the function of some lights, things like that. Uh, you know, off of a standard household outlet, if you're getting the, ready, the unit ready, things like that. Now, what this is not good for is going to be hydraulic appliances. So running the air conditioner, microwave, things like that. If you do wish to run those appliances on 15 amp service, First off, you're not gonna be able to run them at the same time, but you can squeak by running your air conditioner off of 15 amp service if you further invest into what we call a dog bone style reducer. So it accomplishes the same thing. It is just separated by about 12 inches worth of cord. And what that 12 inches of cord is going to do is actually help dissipate heat a, hot, a whole lot better for those hydraulic appliances. Now, riding right next to that, we are going to find our cable satellite inlet. What this is going to do is utilize a standard RG6 cable fitting to allow you to pass through those TV services through the interior of the unit to the designated TV areas. So whether that's going to be an aftermarket satellite package or a park cable service, this is going to be your inlet. And again, that will terminate at the designated TV area of the camper. Also, we got our in-tube bumper storage here, or two bumper storage. Uh, idea being is you can go ahead and remove these caps from either side and store your sewage hose or really any long storage that you wish to do so there in the bumper. Also here at the rear, of course, first things first is going to be our roof access ladder. Now this opens us up to a great time to talk about structural maintenance throughout the unit. Uh, what you're going to want to do is get on a 90 day maintenance schedule and we are going to inspect all of the seals throughout the unit. So anywhere here on the body where two pieces come together, 
they're going to utilize some sort of sealant. More often than not, you'll find a standard silicone, 100% silicone um, product. You can go ahead and source that from any RV parts department or any hardware store. Now on the roof, they're going to utilize a slightly different product. It's a self-leveling lap sealant. It's not as readily available, so you'll probably will find yourself sourcing that from a, a RV dealer. Now, one thing to keep in mind is when we are inspecting these components and these seals, is we're looking for any sign of, any sign of degradation, whether that's going to be cracking, peeling, separation, anything like that, we are going to do our best to touch up that area as necessary. So remove the bead that is currently there, replacing it with a new bead of silicone, smooth it out, all good stuff. Now also on the roof, you kind of, it's self-leveling sealant. So it's not something that's like precise in nature. If you do see any, again, of those, any of that degradation, you're just gonna kind of just puddle it over top of it. Make sure that it is making a nice good seal. That is how the product is designed to be used. Now, moving on here further, up top, another cool thing that Ibex does is they go ahead and pre-wire you or set you up to add a Furon backup camera at your leisure. Uh, they make it very easy to do so. It, it's a four screw installation. You remove the four screws, you plug a 3.5 millimeter jack uh, into the camera and screw it back down and you're good to go. It is a wireless camera. It does get its power from the marker lights. So the light, as long as these marker lights are on, that is going to give you a full time rear view. Also, we have our spare tire back here. It is a full size matching wheel, which is cool. Sometimes with these, when they have these kind of off-road tires, they won't give you the matching spare. So that's nice that Ibex has done that. Uh, moving on here to the passenger side of the unit. Uh, first things first is going to be our entry door assist handle. Uh, what you see here is it in the stowed position. If we do want to go ahead and open that up, we just go ahead and lift and it will lock into that outward position. Now, when we go ahead and take a look here at our entry door, we have two types of locks here. We have one for the latch lock and we have one for the deadbolt. Uh, the latch lock here is generally, you know, not a super secure lock. Uh, also, it seems that more people than not have problems with that uh, in utilizing both of these locks. So feel free to go ahead and use that deadbolt. That's the one that's going to be strictly keyed for you. Uh, and go ahead and use that. That's gonna be the most secure and easiest uh, way to do it. Next up, once we go ahead and uh, open up that door, we're gonna go ahead and see our entry steps. Uh, now these are very popular step option that you're, st you're starting to see uh, more often than not. So when we do go ahead and lower these, it's important to note that that door does actually have to be fully open or it's gonna go ahead and catch here on the, the side of that. So. Next up, we just go ahead and easily unlock them here with this blue uh, pull latch. So we pull that, we lower them down here. Uh, these are, you know, of course, not only very easy to uh, set up and, and, and put away, they are also very, very stable. That's why they're so popular. Another really cool uh, function of these is going to be the adjustable legs here. Now that's going to make up for any variances in ground grade, things like that. They are super easy to adjust you'll see this little silver kind of trigger or button here on each leg. It is just as easy as pushing that in, going to the next available hole, so on and so forth until you are uh, level with your ground grade. Now moving on here, we kind of have our outside kitchen area. Uh, not only have a kind of a separate food prep surface, but you also have your griddle here. We're gonna show you in just in a minute how to go ahead and take that down and stow it away. Uh, but before we do so, we wanna talk about how you actually use the equipment. So uh, what you're going to find included here is going to be a secondary propane line. This is going to go ahead and utilize those quick connect features to make those gas connections. So you will find underneath the camper here, a quick connect propane connection. So uh, if the dust cap isn't already removed, go ahead and remove that. We're then going to slide that locking collar back. We'll insert this male end fully. Once we've done so, that will go ahead and snap back into place, locking that in. We do have a valve here. We want to go ahead and open that valve up. No need to fear. You do have a secondary valve here. So I guess make sure at least one of them is closed. Once we've done that, we will come to the appliance itself and we will see again that, that kind of redundant fitting there. We slide that locking collar back. 
while pushing forward. Once we're fully seated, again, that's going to go ahead and lock on. And then we open up that valve. Now, generally it's probably gonna be most easy if you just kind of momentarily remove this griddle uh, off of the top so you can go ahead and inspect the burner. And then when we go ahead and light, it's kind of like lighting a pilot light. Now it does have a piezo igniter in there so you don't have to use like a lighter or anything, but you hold this in to actually activate that flow of propane. And then as you rotate it, it's going to go ahead and spark that igniter. Uh, of course, once you've let that propane flow through the lines, it should light up for you, no problems. Now, when removing the, the unit itself or all of this equipment to go ahead and stow, uh, you can see it's held on, it's like two separate pieces. So you have the bracket that kind of mounts to the camper and then the grill is going to be slid onto that. So first thing up is going to be uh, removing these cotter pins and you'll do that to both sides. And then it's as easy as just sliding that grill off of the camper. Of course, probably would be best to go ahead and disconnect it from the propane source first. But once you've done so, you can go ahead and fold these arms up. And we're gonna do that by pushing this spring release there on the underside. And then just lift up and towards you, that's gonna come right off. We can go ahead and replace the griddle top to our griddle. And then this shelf again is just going to lift up and off of that rail. And this does have that folding kick out so uh, you can go ahead and store that flat. Uh, now moving on here, next up is going to be our furnace exhaust. You're gonna see that here. Uh, now with any propane appliances on these campers, it's going to be my ultimate recommend, recommendation to go ahead and add some bug screens. Uh, reason being is mud daubers, flying insects are attracted to the smell of propane. Uh, generally these appliances are pretty much wide open to flying insect intrusion without the added bug screen. So do yourself a favor, go ahead and install those while taking delivery of the unit. Uh, that way you can protect these appliances from the start. Now, again, this is an exhaust vent. Biggest thing with it is just to let it exhaust. Uh, make sure that you're not blocking that airflow uh, with maybe a lawn chair or something while out here enjoying this space. Uh, it does blow very hot air when it is on. It will generally cause damage to anything that's in front of it, but you'll also be restricting the flow. Uh, moving on here, if we go ahead and take a look down on the underside of our camper, we're going to see our low point drains. Those are going to be the lowest point in the unit's plumbing. That's how we are going to drain everything in between water source and uh, water source and fixture. So everything in between. Now we will drain those every single time we are taking the unit into storage for more than seven days. So keep in mind that we will drain the freshwater holding tank only if it's been in use. We'll then come over here and we'll drain those low point drains. Lastly, we're gonna finish up with the water heater. We're gonna talk about that here in just a few minutes. Those do have valves on each one of those lines and they are gravity feed. So it is just as simple as opening up that valve, give it a few minutes to drain that water and you'll be good to go. Now up top here, you have a slightly different, still considered a quick connect sprayer, but it's slightly different. You can see that you have two teeth on that and then you have corresponding teeth on the actual uh, fitting there. And it's like a twist connection. So you plug straight in and you rotate that clockwise like a half a turn. It's gonna go ahead and lock that on and self pressurize this at the same time. Next up is going to be our six gallon capacity dual source water heater. What I mean when I say that it's dual source is it will not only run on full 110 volt electricity when you are in the capacity of an RV park, but it will also run on propane gas with 12 volt direct spark ignition for when you are off grid or boondocking. So, uh, the way that they kind of separate these switches is you are going to find your 110 volt heating element switch here on the exterior of the unit. That is just an easily on off toggle switch. One thing to mention with this that I have seen people forget in the past is when you do go ahead and drain this for, uh, excuse me, for storage, make sure that you turn that off first. Um, seems to be like because of the location possibly that it's something that a lot of people forget. So the manufacturer is very kind of specific on the way that you are going to maintain this unit and store it and things like that. Uh, we're gonna get ready to talk about that here in just a second. So 
what they do or what they recommend is that anytime, just like with the rest of the unit, anytime the unit's gonna be in storage for more than seven days, you need to go ahead and drain the water heater separate of the system. Uh, you're gonna do that, number one, first step in that is going to be letting the unit cool down. Uh, give it a lot longer than you may think. Generally, I recommend my customers to let it sit overnight. Uh, so once you are confident of the temperature, we do need to depressurize the, the unit as a whole, essentially, uh, to go ahead and safely drain this. So what we're going to do is we are going to cut off the inflow of water to the, to the unit overall. So if we are using the city water connection, that's as easy as turning that water off at the valve. If we're using that potable, or that, excuse me, that water pump and potable water tank, you're just gonna flip that water pump switch off. Now, once we've done that, we are going to go to the hot side of any fixture within the unit. Uh, of course, since we do not have hot water on the exterior, that's going to limit us to, of course, the kitchen sink or the bathroom sink. So once, we've, once we get there, we're gonna open up that hot line what that's going to do is allow any excess pressure that is built up within the unit to be relieved from there. Once we relieve that pressure, we're going to come back out to the unit itself. We're gonna go ahead and grab an inch and a 16 socket and extension. We're gonna use that to drain here. Uh, now you go ahead and remove that. The remaining five and a half, six gallons of water within the unit are going to you know, purge from that location. So before we return the unit back to service, it's very important that we prime or pump six gallons of water into the water heater, of course, before we start trying to heat it. So to do so, uh, first off, we are going to replace your drain plug here. Once we've done so, we're going to repressurize the unit overall. So turn on that water pump or turn on that uh, city water connection. Once you've done so, we're again going to go to the hot side of the fixture within the unit. We're gonna turn that on. Now, what you're going to see is a little bit different of a scenario at that fixture. You're gonna see a lot more water coming from it, but also a lot more air as well. What's happening is it's displacing the air that has since filled the tank and replacing it with water. Uh, that whole process will generally take about five minutes, but once that flow normalizes at the fixture, that is your indicator that you are full and you can actually start heating your water with your desired source. Uh, one other thing to mention is keep in mind that we do need to protect these from the intrusion of mud daubers and flying insects, things like that. So one thing to mention is you do have your hood vent here up top. Now that of course corresponds with the overhead vent fan and the light above your stove. Uh, one thing to mention is you do need to open this before prepping a meal on the inside and you do need to close it when you're packing up shop before you're going down the road. So it is just a friction fit. You just go ahead and reach up and pull it out and that will be enough to open it up for you to go ahead and prep a meal. And then when you go down the road, just again, reach up, go ahead and push it shut until you feel that click and you're gonna be good to go. That just about covers it here on the exterior of the Ibex. Let's go on the inside and check out those appliances and accessories. Here we are on the inside of the Ibex. Uh, first things first, uh, on the side of the cabinetry here, you're going to find a on off toggle switch. Uh, what that's going to control is just the backlighting here or under shelf lighting. We then have a couple USBs as well, some chargers. Allow you to go ahead and charge any devices while you're utilizing this area. A couple hooks, a really cool kind of bottle opener there as well. And then we also have a very important piece of safety equipment. Now, every single time we take the unit out, it is very important that we test our safety equipment. With this particular appliance, we will go ahead and press the green tab down. If it springs back, that means we're good to go. Uh, if not, it's gonna be time to replace the unit uh, with a fire extinguisher of your choice. And then coming up here, uh, we have kind of our main switch cluster. Uh, what we're going to first have is going to be a on off switch for the back lighting here or inside lighting there of the cabinetry. We have an in interior light switch, which is going to take care of most of the overhead uh, ceiling lights. Now do keep in mind, there is a push button on each one of those lights. So you can really kind of control which lights come on and off with that switch. Uh, we then have our porch light switch. We saw that on the exterior of the unit, just a bright white LED porch light uh, to light this space when you're enjoying that porch setup. And then we have our awning lights, which corresponds with an LED light strip on that awning tube to again, help further kind of light up that space. And then we have our slide room in and out switch. Now, as mentioned on the exterior of the unit, this is 
this unit is equipped with the Schwintec slide out system. So what that means when, for you, uh, when it does come to bring that slide in or out, we are going to want to go the full direction of travel. So avoid any short burst or partial openings. If we're bringing the slide in, come fully in. If we're running the slide out, go fully out. Awning, extend and retract. Uh, now this is slightly different. This is going to be a momentary switch. Now you can run that awning partially out or partially in, uh, essentially following that sun in the sky if you choose to do so. Uh, it does not matter uh, where you stop it essentially. Now one thing to remember is if I were to go ahead and fully extend this awning but I wasn't watching out the window and it reached that fully extended position, it will actually continue to, to roll out uh, but essentially be rolling back in if that makes any sense. So it will fully extend into the outward position and then start rolling back up inside out. So just something to be aware of. Of course, you will want to be watching and making sure you're not running it into your neighbor's camper anyway. So uh, that may go without saying there. Uh, now moving on here, we have our jackknife sofa down low. This is going to make a secondary sleeping area for you. Uh, first things first is going to be removing your side cushions here. Uh, we can go ahead and get those out of the way. And then you will go ahead and like a futon or anything else, you just grab from the bottom, kind of help at the top. That's going to go ahead and lay that out flat. Now, one thing to mention is that if we go ahead and lift this up, what that's going to expose here is going to be your lockbox. It's another really cool feature that IvoX is doing. Uh, whether you want to store some kind of valuables in that particular spot, you can do so. This is going to be keyed exactly the same as the entry door. So a little bit of thought went into that and it's enjoyable to see. Now, also here in the space, we're going to have a 15 amp outlet on either side of that kind of couch area. Again, to allow you to be able to power any devices from multiple locations. So a couple different styles of windows in this particular location. Uh, first one up is going to be what I call a, a school bus style window because it reminds me of the, the bus windows when I was a kid. They have these two tabs, you slide those in. That will allow you to go ahead and lift that up and then they snap back into that open position. Of course, all of these windows, no matter the opening style, are going to utilize that same pull down friction style shade. But then here on the back wall, we have a, a, lot, a lot larger window so it opens quite a bit different. Uh, this is also considered an emergency exit. Uh, basically with this particular window, it's just large enough for you to go ahead and remove the screen and crawl out of it, is I think why they designate it as an emergency exit. Anywho, uh, this one's just going to have a spring-loaded clip here. So you pull that towards you, you're going to slide to the right. That'll allow that window to open up easy. And then again, we have our pull-down shade. Now, these under cabinet lights, those are not on that main light switch, so you will have to turn these on and off uh, separate of that main switch. Uh, coming here into the dinette area, uh, we're going to talk about how we make the dinette into a bed. So this is also going to be another sleeping area for you. Um, with a tabletop of this size, it can be slightly cumbersome, so do yourself a favor and go ahead and kind of get these cushions slightly out of the way, at least lift it up. So it's gonna make it easy for you to lower that tabletop. Uh, this is what we call in the biz a pedestal style table. So what that means for you is you have two flanges uh, on the tabletop and two flanges on the floor and then a friction fit pole that kind of holds everything together. So uh, starting out as best you can, separate the pieces. Uh, if you're lucky, the tabletop will come off of the poles in the Floor flange will hold those into place, but oftentimes uh, that doesn't happen that way. Um, and it looks like I got lucky. So with that being said, we're gonna move that out of the way. We're then going to separate these again from that floor flange. We can go ahead and stash these over here on the couch for now. And then it's very easy and kind of self-explanatory from there. We take our tabletop. We're going to set that on top of those black bumpers something like that we then lower our cushions back down and then this space in the middle is conveniently sized to be able to go ahead and utilize these back cushions to fill out the space so 
Uh, and then the same thing in reverse to, of course, make it into a dinette table. We're going to remove our cushions here. Once we've done so, we're going to lift our tabletop out of the way. And take our poles again. Insert them nice and snug into the floor flange. And then it's as easy as just matching up the flanges to the poles here of the tabletop. So it's very easy to do. It shouldn't take you more than a couple minutes uh, when you're doing it fresh, but I think I got that tabletop backwards. Shouldn't take you more than a couple minutes uh, either way, especially once you kind of get used to what you're doing. And there you go. Um, under bench storage on each of these, um, you know, which is nothing crazy, just gives you uh, some, some added space uh, to go ahead and put your stuff in. We're then going to come over here uh, to the Air Excel thermostat. Now, uh, this is not only going to control our air conditioning, but it's also going to control our furnace as well. A uh, single mode button with up or down arrows for temperature. So we go ahead and push that once. That's going to take us into our fan options first. Now your options are uh, low, high, and auto. So we can see those there. And that is just going to be the fan speed. And then we go ahead and look and that takes us right into our air conditioner mode. And again, we see that high and low designation and fan speed. So what that means when you are in the air conditioner mode is that, is that that fan will continue essentially to run whether or not it is hit this thermostatic temperature or not. So to kind of keep that actually, you know, right where you want it functioning more like it would in the residential sector, you do need to go one step further and go into the auto side of things. So you'll still have that low and high designation, but you'll also have auto behind it. That's going to automatically shut off that fan when it does reach that thermostatic temperature. And then if I keep going through here, next up is going to be the furnace. Now, once this realizes what I'm trying to do, it's going to go ahead and kick on that blower motor immediately. 16 seconds after that, it ignites. By that 30 second mark, it's producing noticeable heat. Now, in the event that, uh, you know, it were to set off your smoke alarm in that first 15 minutes of operation, which your smoke alarm is actually located up here, um, if that furnace were to set that off, that's from the manufacturer of the furnace, that's 100% acceptable. Uh, every time you light a furnace in the RV, it's almost like lighting it in your house the first time, uh, the first time of the year, every single time when you're going down the road, you're gonna be uh, have dust being deposited on it, uh, things like that. Uh, as it continues to run, that efficiency rating goes way up. So that may happen. Of course, don't worry about it as long as it is within the first 15 minutes of operation. But while we're here at the smoke alarm, uh, don't forget to go ahead and test your safety equipment every single time you take the unit out. This is part of that. This is a nine volt, nine volt battery driven smoke alarm, just like you'll find at home. Uh, do yourself a favor and keep a spare nine volt battery with the unit uh, in the event that this were to start chirping at you in the middle of the night or something. Of course, we could never recommend removing that battery. Uh, make sure you have a spare one to replace it. Um, Coming here into the television or the kitchen area, excuse me, uh, you do have a television. Uh, this is buckled in for transit. So go ahead and remove the buckle. What that will allow you to do is go ahead and swing this out into the common area of the camper. Uh, whether you're sitting on the couch or at the dinette, you can go ahead and angle that pretty much in any direction. It is a 12 volt TV, which is great. That will allow you to go ahead and take advantage of that if you are fully off grid. And then very importantly below that, you are going to find your uh, antenna booster plate. Now what that does is that what goes ahead and powers the onboard uh, omnidirectional digital over the air television antenna. Uh, you can notice the red light and there is a button right beside that red light. Uh, that powers on that antenna. So if we're looking to take advantage of that digital programming, make sure that red light is on. We're then going to do a channel search on the television. It will automatically search out the best signal uh, and bring in that programming, of course, dependent on that signal. 
Uh, moving here into the kitchen further, uh, of course you have your JBL speaker that is included. That's kind of a nice touch. Uh, gives you a, a, a just kind of an added bonus uh, throughout the camper since you do not have a hard, you know, hard wired speakers, hard wired head unit, things like that. Uh, other than that, we're gonna find a couple 15 amp outlets there. Uh, nice round kitchen sink here. Uh, again, this is kind of your usual suspects, things that you're gonna find in, in every RV. The styling is of course uh, exceptional, but functionality wise is, is very much as to what you're used to. Uh, on the underside here, we have uh, quite a bit of cabinet space, uh, which again is, is a nice touch. The floor plan of this unit is uh, really open. It's, it's really enjoyable, but they did not skimp on the amount of uh, cabinetry and storage space that you find throughout the unit. And then uh, down low as well, we have our uh, microwave oven here. Now this is not only a microwave, but this is a what they consider a three-way grill or a three-way oven. That means it is a convection oven. It is a microwave oven. And it also has a heating element on the top that kind of allows you to utilize it as a uh, grill as well. So uh, in terms of function, it is very going to be very indicative of a microwave. You have your mode buttons up, up top, a couple presets below that, time and temperature, uh, stop, clear, start, things like that. Uh, is again going to utilize that kind of turntable style. You, this grating here is going to be used for convection. And then we can see that heating element there at the top. Uh, above that, we have your cooktop, uh, suburban branded cooktop with a tempered glass countertop extender. So we, of course, first off, we'll flip that out of the way. Once we've done so, um, when we're looking here at the controls, you of course have your piezo igniter there. You have the switch for these blue lights, uh, and then your burner controls here. So very easy to go ahead and light these up. Uh, it's displayed light on the dial there we turn to that and it's as easy as going ahead and rotating that sparker until we see a flame uh, at the burner we're trying to light now you'll hold that in once you see that flame for about three seconds give that thermal coupler enough time to heat up and it will stay on uh, by itself uh, another thing to mention is if you have just prepped a meal on here uh, give it enough time to cool down before we go ahead and trap that heat in with this tempered glass top uh, you don't want anything to happen to that and then uh, above that, we have our standard hood vent and fan. Uh, again, this is very kind of traditional stuff uh, that you're going to find in just about any RV on the market, but uh, it is there. Uh, again, some more storage up top here for dishes or whatever you feel inclined to uh, fill the space with. And then that takes us here to our Norcold 12 volt compressor style fridge. Uh, this is one of my favorite fridges that are is on the market right now. Um, you're kind of seeing a shift in the industry as a whole from those uh, standard ammonia absorption three-way refrigerators to these 12-volt compressor style fridges. Uh, and it's a welcome, advance, uh, a welcome advancement if you ask me. Uh, when we go ahead and take a look here at the display, of course you have your on-off button here and our temperature control here, or that's gonna take us into the different modes. Now, my favorite thing about this, which you generally will not find on not only most compressor style fridges, but most uh, RV fridges in general, is you can have a separate control for the uh, freezer as to the refrigerator. And that's just not something you're generally going to find. Um, you know, the limitations of an ammonia absorption system really don't allow that to be possible. Uh, so it's really cool. Uh, you also have this night mode and, and what I believe that does, and I'll have to kind of study up on this, but I do believe that night mode is just going to give you kind of like a, like a eco mode that is uh, more efficient during the night and, and things like that. Um, but don't quote me on that. Uh, and then below that, we have our converter panel box here. Uh, this is going to house not only our 12 volt appliances, but our 110 volt appliances as well. Uh, you'll see them listed in terms of function here on the door. Uh, as mentioned, everything here on the right side is an automotive blades type fuse available at any RV parts department or auto parts store. Uh, do yourself a favor, just like a spare nine volt battery, keep a spare set of fuses within the unit. Uh, as, as Faye would have it, if you are out there camping and you don't have a spare, you'll probably inevitably need one. So make sure you have some spares with that in the event you need to change. 
And then on the left side there, we have our standard resettable 110 volt light switch style breaker, same variant you're going to find in your uh, breaker box at home. Uh, other than that, this is a converter. So what it's doing is it is switching a 110 volt uh, electricity to 12 volt. That's what's essentially powering all of these 12 volt appliances while you're plugged in uh, to shore power as well as recharging your battery. Uh, now at times of high power consumption, uh, where you have this thing like fully lit up like a Christmas tree, this does have a cooling fan for those components. Uh, you may feel that fan kick on, you may hear it kick on, you may even kind of feel some heat coming from this. Uh, that's totally normal. Uh, of course, that there is you know some heat, uh, some heat that is produced when that switch over from 110 volt to 12 volt happens, and, and that's what you're seeing there with that. Uh, and then moving over here, we have our, uh, again, a very important piece of safety equipment is going to be our carbon monoxide LP leak detector. Uh, of course, uh, to sound extremely redundant, we uh, do test our safety equipment every single time we take the unit out. Uh, this is no exception. This particular unit is wired into the 12 volt section of the camper, so there is no battery to change or maintain or anything like that. Uh, it is wired in. Uh, all we need to do is press this test button. It's going to let you know with an audible tone that it is in good working order, and that's it. Uh, now, as to which gas it's sensing and, and how, when it's working and things like that, it is outlined here, uh, you know, what the different tones mean, what the different light flashes means and things like that. So make sure you're taking a look at that uh, before, you know, you possibly were to have any anything happen. Uh, and then we have our road vac, intro vac here. Uh, this is a really cool feature. You're seeing these in uh, different units across the board. Uh, in its base capacity, there's there's no hose attachment or anything like that. You could contact Roadback and, and upgrade that, and that would allow you to plug a hose here into the unit, and then of course trapes around the unit and, and use it in that capacity. Uh, it's also very much usable in this kind of base mode. Uh, reason being is because you have this little door here, so you would use a broom and you would uh, sweep your dust panel uh, to this location, and uh, when you are satisfied, you go ahead and lift that up. Um, what that will do is, of course, if we were plugged into 110 volt electricity, that's going to automatically kick that on and you just go ahead and sweep your, your mess up into there and it will, um, of course, suck it into the equip bag uh, throughout the, you know, within the unit. Um, now, to change that bag, uh, it's very easy to do so. You go ahead and stick your finger here in this hole and pour, pull towards you. That's going to allow that to go ahead and come out. And we can see that bag in place. So it actually hooks on in two places. It hooks onto the rear of it, which actually connects it to down here. And then it hooks up to the front, which connects it to if you wanted to add a hose. Um, so when you go ahead and use this, uh, make sure that you, uh, before throwing that bag away, if it were to become full, you take note of the, the bag that is going to fit this. And, um, you know, just so you're not searching around. I don't know if that's in the manual or not, but uh, do yourself a favor. And then when we go ahead and set this back in, we seat the tabs here on my left side first, and then we again pull that towards us to overcome that edge. All right, guys, let's check out the restroom. So, um, you know, nothing too crazy in here, uh, nothing that's gonna need a ton of education, but uh, let's go for it anyway. So uh, one cool feature that you have, you find these on our pods, you find these on, uh, Ibex's is, is going to be the addition of the Thermeister system here. Uh, what this will allow you to do is actually the, the kind of main uh, reasoning for this is, is so you're not like constantly waiting for hot water to actually make its way through the lines and things like that. So what this does is this will actually circulate air or excuse me, circulate water through the system, like recycling it. So it's going to pump it essentially from your freshwater tank back through your freshwater system. And this is a, a kind of piece of thermoplastic, if that's even the right term. But what that means is it changes colors uh, once it gets hot. So uh, once the hot water has actually started to run to the fixture, this will turn, I believe, gray. And what that's going to allow you to do is just, again, conserve water consumption, specifically when you're boondocking and things like that. So you're not turning on the 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 shower and then, you know, there's no hot water or whatever. So. Uh, other than that, a uh, very kind of common shower head here, uh, which is going to have a on-off switch there. Again, that's just for, for 
reasoning of, of water consumption. So uh, the idea being is that once you have hot water at the fixture, you're good to go. You set your cold water kind of mixed in for how you like it. Uh, and then you're taking a shower and you don't want to change that mixture every single time you want to cut this water off. And just to let you know, you're going to be cutting the water off because six gallons of water does not translate, six gallons of hot water, I should say, does not translate to an exceptionally long shower. You'll probably find yourself doing military Navy style showers, which is going to call for you to shut this off multiple times during your shower. So uh, what that's going to allow you to do is, again, do that without having to fine tune your mixture every single time. Uh, other than that, you get the nice skylight here that's going to give you some natural light, which everybody enjoys. Uh, you have a magnetic hold open here on your cloth or a magnetic close, I should say, on your cloth uh, shower curtain. One cool feature is that this little bow here, uh, believe it or not, that makes the gives you the illusion of a lot more space in there. Uh, if you're in there, you know, washing your hair, moving your arms around, things like that, it does give you kind of that extra wing room, uh, which, of course, is never a bad thing. Uh, other than that, uh, of course, standard hand washing sink here. Not going to spend too much time with that. Uh, we have our medicine cabinet uh, there. And then above my head, we have a exhaust fan. Uh, now this does lock in the stowed position. So we go ahead and pull that handle down and we will crank that open. And then we have our fan on and speed settings on one single button. And then you have, uh, you know, four fan speeds and it will really get up and start exhausting air. Uh, main focus or main reason for that is of course, a small bathroom like this, you're taking a nice hot shower, you're gonna have a ton of moisture in the air. This is gonna help pull that moisture out. Uh, and then we shut the fan off. We go ahead and crank the fan down uh, because very importantly, we never want to go down the road with our hood vents in the open position. We snug that down, we go ahead and push that handle up to go ahead and lock that down as well. Uh, also here, uh, kind of a, a quite a bit of stuff going on here in the restroom. Uh, you have uh, all the way here to the left is going to be your overhead lights. And then you have some heated tank systems, which I wasn't aware that the Ibex had, which is an excellent feature for cold weather camping. Uh, that's going to keep your freshwater holding tank and wet, as well as your wastewater from freezing when you're in sub-freezing environments. And then we have our tank monitor system. Now we've referenced this on the exterior of the unit. Uh, what this will allow you to do is go ahead and monitor the level of your tanks. We talked about uh, how important it was to only dump that black water tank specifically when it is full or before changing locations. Uh, but this is going to give you kind of a real time readout of where your things sit. So battery is about two thirds to one third full. We're running off of battery power now, so that's no surprise. Our freshwater tanks reading full, black water is empty, uh, gray water is empty. So basically when you're looking at this, the more light you see, the fuller that particular thing you are trying to uh, evaluate is. One thing to mention is when you are plugged into shore power because that converter is in play, uh, if we're trying to test the battery, it's always gonna indicate full. So that's just the way that technology works. Uh, to get a true readout of where your battery sits, just momentarily unplug from shore power Go ahead and test. That is going to give you that real-time readout. Uh, and then below that, we saw on the exterior of the unit, we saw our 110-volt water heater switch to go ahead and utilize that 110-volt heating element. Uh, this particular switch is going to be our propane side. So how this propane side works is when you go ahead and flip this switch, it, it, it obviously turns it on and turns it into lighting mode. It will try and light three times. If for whatever reason it does not light by the end of that third try, it's going to stop trying. Uh, what you'll see and how you'll know that it has not ultimately lit and it's not trying to light anymore is there's a little red fault light right above the button. If you come back five minutes late, and this, this light will flicker on and off as it's going through its lighting cycles, but ultimately if you come back five minutes later and it's just red solid like that, then that means it hasn't lit. So that could happen for a couple of reasons. Uh, maybe you have your service valve closed on the tank. That's a realistic option. Maybe you're out of gas. Uh, that happens to the best of us. Also, you know, with a unit of this size, uh, if the unit, if the water heater on the propane side hasn't been ran in a while, those propane lines have bled that gas out and have now filled with air. Just may take a few tries to actually get that gas from the cylinder to the appliance. Uh, in the event that, that happens, just go ahead, check out, make sure you have gas, make sure the valve's open. If not, 
or if so, then just come in here, flip the switch off, flip it back on. It will take it out of that standby mode and it will start to cycle another three times. Generally, if the issue is just the lines being full of air, uh, it'll light on the first try of that second lighting cycle. And then we have our water pump switch in here as well. Now that is going to, again, pressurize that fresh water holding tank, uh, draw that water up from the tank to the fixtures and make it usable. So very easy, that's going to be our boondock or off-grid option. And then below that we have our solar charge controller. Uh, what this does is this gives you kind of an information center uh, to not only let you know where your battery voltage is, but it'll also let you know how many amps you're taking in via solar and things like that. So it is going to not only be uh, an information center for things like that, uh, but it's also gonna be the brains behind that solar setup. It's gonna intake energy as necessary, topping off your batteries. But once those batteries are in fact full, it's going to stop taking in energy. So to not overcharge them. Uh, next up is going to be our toilet here. Now this is a pedal flush style toilet. Uh, what that means is you give it a light press here on the floor that's gonna feed water to the bowl, which is always a good idea. That's going to help keep those bad smells down when you go ahead and flush the unit. Uh, and then go ahead and push to the floor that, that flushes it. Uh, now keep in mind, all of your products or black tank maintenance stuff is going to be introduced from this location. So if that's going to be uh, deodorizing product, sensor cleaners, tissue dissolvers, uh, generally you name it, if it has to do with the black water tank, it's going down that hole. So um, also with that being said, make sure we're using RV grade toilet paper, things like that, if we're using those uh, specific products, making sure we're following the manufacturers of those uh, chemical treatments, you know, following their uh, instructions on how to use them. Generally, you will chase them with a amount of water uh, dependent on the product that you use. So just making sure we're, uh, you know, following what the manufacturer wants us to do. Uh, other than that, if you are on grid, you have access to full-time running water, uh, take advantage of that. Of course, I stress the importance of keeping that black water tank in as wet or flowing conditions if you can. Uh, so if you can, go ahead and take nice long flushes. Uh, kind of the wetter the better when it does come to that black water tank. Uh, anything to help dissolve that toilet paper and body waste, anything to kind of keep things free flowing better. Coming here into the main bedroom, uh, of course you have a pocket door to give yourself some privacy. Uh, these pocket doors are really nice. They actually have utilized magnets here to keep that shut. Uh, when going down the road, just, just so it's not sliding back and forth, uh, make sure you strap that in. Uh, now coming further here into the bedroom, uh, first things up you're gonna notice is going to be your emergency exit. Uh, very important uh, to know your emergency exits and how to use them. If your entry door were to become blocked for whatever reason, uh, you can go ahead and exit the unit from this location. It will also perform as a window or, you know, like a normal window, which you can have it uh, in an open position that will allow you to feed air throughout the unit. Uh, but in the event of an emergency, you would go ahead and yank that screen out of the way. That window will full swing or swing full open like a doggy door, uh, potentially allow you to exit uh, if need be. Now, also coming here into the unit, we see this cool uh, backlighting. The switch is going to be on that side of the bed. We can demo that when we get there. Uh, but you have a couple USBs on each side of the bed as well. And then if we look down low, we have 110 or 15 amp outlets on each side of the bed as well. Uh, not to mention the above head and side storage, things like that. Uh, obviously you can see, but uh, you also are going to have some under bed storage, which is again, a very efficient use of space. Um, so any big things, you can go ahead and stuff under there, any extra bedding, things like that. Uh, other than that, um, you know, you have the overhead lights here. I'm going to kind of quickly come over here to this side and we can see our switch there for the backlighting. We talked about that. And then, um, although we did get a shot of this, one thing to mention is this is going to be your inverter switch. So we would just go ahead and push that and push that and hold until we see the green light. Uh, that will be for our inverter. Now, just to let you know that inverter is going to allow us to draw off the battery and power 110 volt appliances, things like that. And then beside that, we have our main GFI outlet. Now, all the receptacles throughout the unit are on a single circuit. What that means is if one of them were to get overloaded, they all kind of follow suit. You would go ahead and reset this if that were to happen. So. 
Um, just keep in mind that if your outlets or receptacles aren't working, come back here into the bedroom, more than likely it's just going to be resetting that plug. Uh, only other thing I believe that is going to be worth mentioning here in the bedroom uh, is going to be your overhead vent there. Now, uh, there's no fan or anything into that. Now, it is pre-wired for one. So if you yourself wanted to add one down the road or you'd like us to do so at time of delivery, we certainly can. Uh, Functionality-wise, it's going to be the same as any of the other fans throughout the units. You just crank it open, making sure you're not forgetting to close it before going down the road. All right, guys, that just about covers it with the walkthrough here on the Ibex. Uh, thank you so much for your time. We hope you enjoy the content that we provide. Thank you so much again for taking the time to watch our videos. Have a great day.